Thank you so much, Summer, for preparing this amazing brunch for us. Um, it's been a really lovely experience. Uh, thank you for teaching me all of the things you did in the kitchen. I feel like I'm so prepared now when I'm in a, <laughs> when I'm in a jam. Um, and thanks for just treating your mom and I to this lovely, lovely meal. Um, so I started cooking when I was five years old. I started because well, I used to watch my parents in the kitchen and it just used to be a very um, fun thing we did as a family. So I got involved in it when I was about five years old and from there it just became something fun and then as I got older, whenever I was stressed or had anxiety or overwhelmed, I'd go into the kitchen and I'd just experiment, make different meals just to clear my head and, you know, feel calm and it was my peace. It was my escape out of the real world whenever I was, when it became too much for me. So yeah, I think that it just became my version of therapy and that's why I love it so much. Thank you, it's so, so pretty. Tell me about this meal. So I have a cauliflower rice, a Mediterranean grilled chicken, a lemon orange refresher, toasted bread, a cauliflower and kale avocado salad, lemon roasted potatoes, and hummus with tomato and cucumber salad on top. Yes. Yum! Yes. Well, let's get started. It looks so beautiful. Uma is a heritage brand and you are a global fashion architect and I have to say you are the reason that many of us girls like myself even dared to try wow. to get into fashion, hands down, wow, hands you. down. When you were thinking, tell us about what you were thinking when you thought about where you'd be bringing Puma into the future with mm -hmm. this line. I think I really wanted to marry sports and style, or the idea that something that was functional could be fashionable. And we were coming out of you know the pandemic, you know when the first collection launched, and it was well, we're still in it, but. We were dealing with a very trying time, and most of us lived in our sweats and our athletic wear and our athleisure wear, and it became part of our lifestyle. And I knew that once we came out on the other side of this, that we would still we would still be in that place where we would be looking for things that served us. What you know, what gave, what made us feel like it had purpose in our lives. And if I could create something that was not only functional but fashionable, like the idea of wearing your leggings and a blazer, you know, like you're doing today, just the idea of marrying sporty and sophisticated and also having a demographic that was very broad be attracted to this collection was my goal. The fact that a 17-year-old to a 55-year-old is interested in this collection, has bought into this collection, has bought into the concept of life as a sport, I know that I'm heading down the right track. So yeah, tell me about life as a sport. Well, when I think about my life, you know, I feel like our lives actually, I feel like we're running a marathon. We feel like just everything we do, you know, we do it to win. Yeah. And we do it with such conviction, we do it with such purpose and passion. No matter what it is that you're doing in life, I feel like it, it could, you know, you feel like an Olympian when you cross the finish line or when you get to that, you know, place that you've worked so hard you know, and you've practiced and you've studied, and you've, you know, and you've literally been working out and trying to get to that place, and then it happens, it's, it's life, yes. you know, and why not, why, why not equate, you know, an athlete to what we do, to, you know, a person's, whether you're in business, whether you're in fashion, whatever it is that you do, whether it's creative corporate, it still becomes part of the school. I love that because, and I never thought about it like that because mm -hmm. I know that we're on the journey. And I think that a lot of us are realizing now that we have to put the practice in mm -hmm. just to use the, the world of athletes. But, you know, you make a mistake, then you try again. You go on this path, then you go on that path. Mm -hmm. But I never equated it to like the discipline, mm -hmm. the the input, the awareness that athletes have to put into their sport, whatever it is. And you know how they say, you know, the best athletes practice for X hours, it's like 10,000 hours, or 10,000 10, hours will make you an expert in, in something. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is that is life, that's yeah. us, you know? And, and I think if we elevate our experience yeah. on that level, 
then, I mean, this just blows my mind because it's a whole way of, new way of thinking of it. And when you think about the brand itself, it's rooted in performance. Yeah. You know, people think about they're like, oh, you know, I need to go and work out or anything that's functional in fashion. They go to the brand that's the go-to. But I want, you know, to kind of start to attract that fashion consumer, you know, for, for people to look at sports in a different way. And it's also about interpretation and how you articulate that. You know, when I first came on, she launched women's basketball for the brand um, in North America. You know, we knew that globally that bas- women's basketball wasn't necessarily as big as it was in America. But, you know, it made sense that we were, you know, that the concept and the idea of life as a sport would really play well globally. And as we've launched this collection globally, we didn't get it. So it's not specifically about that female athlete is celebrating their contribution. And we felt as a brand that that contribution wasn't being highlighted and celebrated enough. Why we put such a commitment into a 24 piece collection, um, you know, certain, certain regions bought into it differently. But, you know, it's been tremendously successful. So it says that there's an appetite not only to celebrate women in sport, but also to celebrate a stylish woman who is sporty. Summer is a teenager now. Like, I remember the first time seeing her in New York at Lincoln uh, Center, and she she still is an extremely beautiful um, person, um, but I remember she was very strong will <laughs> from that time, and I remember your patience, and I remember your guidance, because you were um, guiding her in a way that you were allowing her yeah. to express herself. Yeah. But you were still being the parent. Mm. And now that she's grown into such a wonderful girl, has looking back, how has her growth and her evolution as a person influenced the way you see the world? Well, um, in so many ways. I mean, both my kids have been, you know, so just such a huge part of the evolution of who I am as a person. First of all, they've taught me patience in so many ways, and it happened really naturally. And and as cre- as creative, it's hard to be focused too because you're kind of like all over the place. And you know, they've helped me kind of focus when I'm in the moment, be in the moment. And that's something that we don't get to always do. We take it for granted until we miss so much, so many important parts. You know, I didn't want to miss. You know. A time when she would need me the most, right? And it's like as a teenager, when there's so many outside influences, I feel even more compelled to keep her close, and she feels also compelled to be close to me, which is such a treat, you know, because this is when they find their independence and their own voice, and they want to, you know, they they're adults, they're young adults. But I think there's something to to be said about always making them know, you know, like they have a point of view that's valid. And that I, but I am not there to produce, overproduce them. I'm only there to kind of create a situation where they're allowed to grow and be themselves. I think that's the best gift my mother ever gave me was, one of the best gifts she's ever gave, given me was to kind of just let me be me. Yes. You know, she didn't, you know, as long as I wasn't hurting myself or someone else, she really allowed me to be expressive and creative and she didn't change who I was, she didn't silence me. And I think, you know, I look at my children as like, you know, I, I was the vessel that brought them into the world, but I don't own them. And, you know, because of that, I, the universe owns them in a sense. And I have to allow them to become who they naturally were. And, you know, from inception. And both of them, I saw them from the first day I laid my eyes on them. Some specifically, was something always about her. She started out very kind of shy and timid, and to really see her come into her own. It makes me feel accomplished. You know, it makes me feel like I gave her the space to do that, but also made her feel safe. Yes. And, you know, doing it with her father, I can't take all the credit, and also having a really strong man in her life, I think is also been a huge part of that process. But I think the mother and daughter bond, and having her see how um, you build a career, how you, you know, fight through adversities, how you dis- deal with disappointments. Um, and how you continue to move forward after one and how you make a stumble part of the dance is super important, you know, and she is the editor at large of her life. She's the CEO of her life. And I think that's the best gift that you can give a child is a sense of independence and strength and, and just the idea that they have so much power and remind them of that and, and help them to navigate their way through that. 
Oh my God, that's awesome. That's awesome. So now I have, you know, my son is 14 and we're, we're entering um, that phase in his life where he will come into himself. Yeah. So thank you for that. It's a trying time. They will, yeah. They yeah. will speak up. And at first it's like, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like that. But it's a different generation too. Yes. You know, if I, I, you know, I would say, oh, I would never say that when, you know, to my mother. But I realize it's such a different time. You know, yes. it's been it's been quite a, a balancing act and finding the right picking your battles and finding ways to navigate through conflict and it's natural, you know. You have a really you have a really close relationship with the women in your life and your sister. Mm -hmm. And you have you and your mother talking about Bond, your angel mother. Yes. You guys were so so close. Yeah. What do you think and, and what do you think Summer's generation wants? our generation mm -hmm. and their their grandmothers to, to know about them, to, to, to understand about the way they're living. It's it's a trying time. Mm -hmm. They have withstood a unprecedented moment <laughs> with this pandemic yeah. and the social unrest that has occurred mm -hmm. globally mm -hmm. and is occurring. Um, what do you think they, they want us to, to understand about them and the insight that we need to help them find themselves in this digital world, in this world where social media is so important and integral to their lives. How, what information should we pay attention to in order to help them further? Yeah, I, um, I always say when people say I'm my ancestors' biggest dreams, wildest dreams. Yes. And I'm like, do you understand what that means? It's not just to say it, but understand the power of words. So when we talk about the power of words, you have to give it context. And in context, you have to put action towards that too. So to be intentional is super key. And you know, I I I I instill that in them. It's like it's not just enough to say something, knowing that your words have power, but then also knowing that your action is how things begin to really kind of shift. And to be intentional in everything that you do and know that it has it will have, you know, repercussions, whether it's good or bad, right? And sometimes you don't record, you don't know if it's bad or not because things aren't always received on the other side, the way you kind of perceive it to do, but you always know that when you, when it, when there comes that time where there's a confusion, that you say right away, you know, it was never my intention, it, you know, it was don't blame it on my heart, you know, maybe blame it on, you know, my, my brain for that moment. And I think that people have to have a little bit more um, just um, mercy on everyone. My mother always, was so gracious and you know what I've learned so much from her is to just to think a little bit before you judge and just be have a little mercy because you never know what someone may be going through and so many both my kids graduated over the pandemic I was super sympathetic to the fact that here are these budding young adults that now have to experience graduation prom all these like really milestone moments through a computer you know but then it was also the social you know and rest in it, it was also like a time that they could use their voices to create change and how and how they were going to participate in that and how we were going to be whether either informed or not complacent, how are we going to be. Everyone has to make the conscious decision of how they're going to contribute to what they feel is, is not right and what they, because the new generation, they don't see America or the world the way, you know, 20 years ago sees it. Yeah. They really, they have no idea some of the emotional place that we've all been through we've kind of they, they stand on our shoulders we've been through that for them but they still have a responsibility yes so yes. i'm also reminding them that when you see something you say something maybe you take some time to think about how you're going to navigate around your contribution to this change but it's, it's a little things if you see someone who's on the streets and they may be hungry and you have 10 cents in your pocket you give them that Yes. You know, if you see some, you know, if you see someone who's struggling socially, someone who's being bullied, you say something, you do something. I mean, those little things are a big part of contributing to society. And at the end of your life, you know, your life term, you look back and you know that you made a significant difference in someone's life. That's why I've done the work that I've done over the years, not just because I love clothes, yes. but I know that my contribution in the music industry was bigger than me and bigger than any tangible fashion moment. Yes. You know, it was how we were going to shift the narrative and change the culture and the perception of how people saw people in music of color. And that, to me, is why we're able to 
run the streets of Milan, run the streets of Paris, run the streets of London, and celebrate launches and collections and collaborations and creative direction moments and design moments that we were able to produce and create and give to a consumer. If that isn't the truth, the other day I read in one of the, the biggest newspapers that um, essentially hip hop is the franca lingua of the globe. Yeah. And hands down, yeah. you were there at the forefront creating the imagery yeah. that laid the foundation for what this generation is doing and solidifying yeah. the artists that um, came up in our generation. Mm -hmm. Like when we think about this past Super Bowl, oh, we're in 2022, guys. This past Super Bowl exactly. was a moment. The first time hip hop artists ever performed at the Super Bowl. It was a moment. As a headline, it was like, wow. Next year marks 50 years of hip hop. I mean, it's gonna be a very impactful, I think, memorable year, at least it should be, very celebratory for the contributions of those poets. Yes. And those musicians and those artists who have contributed to the storytelling and shaping the narrative of just culture in general, the culture shifting moments that happen. I feel so proud to be have been part of that. You yes. Know? I know early in my career, I was always afraid of being kind of put into a box, but I realized that I can kind of build this box as big as I want. Yes. You know, and you know, if, if and don't put a lid on it. That's yes. where you can kind of jump in and out of it as, as you will. And that that box is, is so is so huge. Yes. That it was able to influence so many other types of music and culture. And that part makes me feel extremely successful. That that I think that goes back to the point of having patience and perseverance. And I think that you have demonstrated that throughout your career. Um, did you feel, did you have any idea, well, you were, you were creating your box and you weren't putting the lid on it. Did you ever dream that what you were contributing to would be so immense? So there was no social media to, you know, influence your creativity or distract you and compare yourself to someone else. You know, we literally were in the moment and it was just like, we were having fun. And it was, I guess it would be as just as creative and imaginable as what would go on in, you know, when you were creating a collection. Like everything felt like, you know, a, a, a collection for the season. Every music video in my head, I felt like everything that I curated and designed for a specific project felt like it was a runway moment. And it was the same kind of enthusiasm. You got to strike hard, and you got to strike while it's hot. People were watching, and that job was going to lead you to the next job, to the next job. It was going to open doors and opportunities, and start to talk, to influence the consumer, and start to influence and change the narrative. And I think that's what I think those seeds that we planted in the in the, in the late '90s, early 2000s were so that all that what you're seeing now. When you see all of these artists sitting in front row, when you see all of these artists with these collaborative deals, at these sportswear brands, and those, these are things you know um, that we planted seeds years and years ago. And um, this is not my first time as a creative director with a brand in this capacity. Um, and, some, and, and when years go by, you kind of forget someone's contribution if they're doing other things. And sometimes I like to just kind of pull out receipts when I can and just say, you know, those, it's because of this, I really feel that, you know, I'm able to do this. I, I didn't have to ask for permission to do this because I had experienced it before and I knew that I could. Yes. And I always tell people, just trust your ability and know that you've probably experienced something that prepares you for another job or the next chapter of your life and you don't even realize it. So just yes. go back and collect and kind of really reflect that yes. on what your contribution was so that when you have that conversation for the things that you want to do, you can say, well, this is what I've done. Um, I've read that when you started and you started to partner with these high luxury brands, a lot of the times the response was no, because uh, they did not value the contribution of uh, BIPOC, hip hop, mm -hmm. R&B artists. And you became the ultimate um, creative director, <laughs> problem solver, fixer in, in creating looks for your artists, 
for creating uh, accessories, mm -hmm. creating anything they needed style-wise to be able to enhance and illustrate the music mm -hmm. and whatever other art they were, they were producing. Mm -hmm. And you bring all of that today into your work and into this role. Mm -hmm. And um, can you just talk a little bit about that? When I started out, fashion hadn't even met music yet in that way. Designers, especially in Europe, weren't looking at musicians to be part of their campaigns, sit from front of their shows. It was all about the editors and the buyers. It was a different time. And, you know, so when you call and say, oh, you know, this is, can I borrow something for you, you know, from your showroom or from your collection? And we didn't have uh, runway and the dot com to go to. We had to wait for the Colecciones magazines. We had to wait, you know, for the television shows, Elsa Clinch, or, you know, to show you what was going on in Europe. So it wasn't easily accessible, but we knew that it was out there. We see them in the retail store. We know that we didn't have the budgets to, per, you know, purchase them right away. And until we could build up that financial, you know, discipline and tolerance, we weren't able to, you know, so we, we knew we, I knew we had to figure out a way to partner with these brands. And it was, Initially, of course, it was no. So when I got the no, it didn't stop me from continuing to work on that storytelling aspect. And I started to create and design, you know, costumes for these music videos as it related to the treatments. If it was Jay-Z who needed a suit, then, you know, if initially if Armani, you know, wasn't prepared to start to partner with us, that was fine. I built in his first suit that he wore in this music video. It was a yellow linen suit that was very kind of relaxed, Italian, kind of easy, you know, online suit. And it, it just really kind of, I work on, you know, people's personas and personalities and I character develop from there. So it's so much more than just like a styling and design moment. You're really kind of, you know, tapping into a character development conversation, which I've really also applied this discipline in my role at Puma now, as a creative director, I'm thinking about it from a design perspective, from a merchandising perspective, from a styling perspective. So not only is it you know, company facing, but it's consumer facing as it's being worked on style by design. So that consumer starts to feel that this, the experience of the person that created it for them thought about every little aspect um, of what, what their needs are as a consumer and why they need to purchase this, how can it serve them. I'm always like, how does this serve me? Yes. When you buy a luxury piece, and people don't think about sportswear and luxury, but now they are with streetwear being so big, it's becoming the luxury street, streetwear. I'm like, why can't I think about, have a kind of luxury mentality? You know, yes. like how do I want to luxuriate in my leggings, or like, you know, yes. fit of my sports bra, and how does it fit into all of my other aspirational pieces? So it's, I've always thought about that in the world of hip hop. How do I, you know, marry high, high fashion couture with urban music? That's what you're seeing today in all these fashion houses, this natural swag and street style and energy infused into pieces. Designers yes. are doing exactly the character developing within, within, the, within the garment, the juxtaposition of the fit alone. The oversized sagginess is attitude, is, is, is is um you know this energy is 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 swag. It's still it's swag. Yes. And they're designing the look to have swag. Yes. 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 So it's a, and I look and I, I had so much time over the pandemic to think about. Not only was I working on this first collection for for Puma, but I had time to really think about what is it? Yes. That I did then that was so special. Yes. And so my unique point of view and how can I contribute that same ideology to this space. How do I strike hard and make my mark in this space? It was probably the most liberating and reinvent reinvention reinventing time of my the pandemic for me. I was still I was able to focus. Um, I was I was listening, I was aware. It was it was that was the silver lining in the pandemic. Thank you so much for taking time out of your crazy schedule here in Milan um, and coming over and coming over with Summer. Um, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to the universe because this is the first time we're seeing each other. Yeah, we used to have our girls um, dinner pre-pandemic mm -hmm. with the girls in New York during Fashion Week and we haven't been able to do that. Because you also did a tour in the meantime. <laughs> like I did like a lot of things. Um, but if you could give, not but, but could you please give, if, if there's one piece of, of advice 
that you could give to our our women here and um, all the pretty birds, what would it be? Yeah, um, trust your gut. That your your voice and that you know that butterfly that I think we as women like have all the time. It tells us that we're living out loud in our authentic lives, and that we're enough. That just continuously tap into that feeling of being inquisitive and being infinitely curious. I think that that will break will make all your dreams come true. Oh, that's a word. <laughs> <laughs>